Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first session for panel four on evaluation and monitoring. Um, our topic this morning is on renovating existing buildings, one of the key um, challenges in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We've got three presenters um, on evaluating monitoring policies that address that. Two papers take different approaches to identifying the differences between models and actual energy performance. Um, Hermans will describe a top-down approach and then Tobias are looking at a more bottom-up approach. Um, the Hermans is in Netherlands, Tobias is, are in Germany, and then Patrice in between them um, are talking about how they modeled a housing retrofit policy in France piecing together data from a wide range of resources to get a surprising and unfortunately not great result. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we begin with Herman van der Bent, who is joining us from TU Delft, where he is a PhD researcher. We have his pre-recorded um, presentation, and then we will have plenty of time for questions. So also be putting your questions into the Q&A, and we will pick those up to ask Herman after the presentation. Great. Okay, I think we have a, a bit of technical with the sound, so we'll just make sure that we're sharing sound with the presentation as well. We'll start again. We'll also give you, um, you would have seen it in the session description, but also the title of Herman's presentation, Advanced Monitoring and Evaluation of Social yes. Housing Renovations. All right, we should be ready. Here we go. Good afternoon. I'm Herman van der Bent. I work at the University of Technology in Delft in the Netherlands, and I will introduce uh, the topic Advanced Monitoring and Evaluation of Social Housing Renovations. So I work with uh, Dutch Social Housing Stock, owned by Dutch Social Housing Associations, and they own 30% of the Dutch housing stock, and that's the highest percentage in Europe. Dutch Social Housing Associations facilitate living for low-income households up to average income households in the Netherlands. And Dutch Social Housing Associations play an important role in the Dutch strategy to enhance a sustainable built environment. And the main driver to do so is the improvement of energy labels by renovating dwellings. And the energy labels are based on a theoretical calculation of the energy consumption of a dwelling, given its building characteristics, divided by building specific energy budget. And that's based on the EPBD um, regulation, which is governing in Europe and is implemented in all European countries. So we build a monitoring system together with ADUS. It's the umbrella organization of housing associations in the Netherlands. Okay, bear with us. I think our tech support will try to make sure that you can see the text and the pictures here with better resolution. We will work on this just a moment. Okay. 
In the meantime, you'll also see in the session that you can download um, a handout with this, which has the extended abstract that Herman also submitted as part of the EC summer study. So while we're sorting this out, make sure you also get the, the handout there so you can get some background on this. Okay, let's see if it works now. Then secondly, the Dutch network operators um, in the Netherlands, they uh, give the actual energy consumption on an address level to the Central Bureau of uh, Statistics in the Netherlands. And it's privacy uh, sensitive data, but there is an anonymized analyzed environment within the Central Bureau of Statistics where the addresses of the building characteristics from the uh, non-profit housing associations are combined. And there we have a set of 1.6, over 1.6 million dwellings uh, where we have the actual um, building characteristics found and the actual energy consumption. Um, one of the first results of uh, the monitoring system is that there's a very large energy performance gap. And it's widely known in uh, literature. Uh, it exists for several years in several European countries, and that's a discrepancy between the theoretical energy consumption calculated um, in the energy label system uh, and the actual consumption of dwellings. So we see that the gas consumption on the left, uh, the yellow bars are a steep decline in um, a lower gas consumption theoretically, but in actually uh, the average uh, gas consumption it lowers, but the steps are way smaller than theoretically assumed. The same um, can be found for the electricity consumption. We see a yellow declining line with improving energy labels, but the actual energy consumption um, is higher and is almost um, yeah, consistent through uh, the energy uh, labels. And this includes the consumer um, consumption for appliances. So that's not it's not uh, in the yellow bars, but the yellow bars is the building related um, electricity consumption is the declining line and we don't see it in the actual energy consumption. So what is our goal? Our goal is to model the average actual energy consumption by building characteristics empirically. And if we then have a change in the building characteristics in the model, then we model a renovation. And we use three different modeling techniques, a linear regression, a nonlinear regression, and a gradient boosting method. There are some challenges. So uh, we have a large set of different building characteristics. So we have 90 different parameters. So this also means 90 different renovation measures with all uh, sorts of combinations in between you can model. Um, secondly, we need to deal with occupant behavior. So there's a natural spread in the actual energy consumption. So imagine two the same dwellings with different occupants. They will never have the same uh, actual energy consumption. But if you have 100 dwellings which are the same, uh, then you can average out um, the consumption of the, the, the behavior of the occupant. Um, so we need a large set to average the, this mean consumption. Um, then the different modeling techniques have the pros and cons, and we also need to be aware of the cost of some conceptual flaws in the underlying data, and that's also uh, challenging uh, to validate. Um, I will introduce the. So, if we look at the preliminary uh, sector results, then we see here on the left the modeled average uh, gas consumption. So, in yellow. Again, the theoretical consumption in blue, the actual consumption, and then the three uh, empirical models. Um, and they're uh, very close to the actual consumption. And I need to say that the average energy label um, or its underlying uh, energy index are not in the model. So it's purely the building characteristics. Um, so the empirical models, um, they, on a sector level, close the performance gap. And the same uh, image uh, is visible uh, when we plot the uh, electricity consumption uh, by energy label. Um, there also the empirical models um, yeah, are close to the actual energy consumption. And these graphs uh, represent the 1.6 million dwellings we have in the CBS uh, um, 
uh, analyze environment. So then we did a second step. We took a single dwelling and we um, modeled 23 different renovations. And I'm not going to discuss them in detail, but some general ideas that uh, on the left, we have the gas consumption of these dwellings that uh, the yellow bars are still the theoretical estimations and they are way over. There are over estimations uh, of the yeah, energy consumption uh, given its uh, renovation. And on the, on the top, we see some more um, insulation measures and in the middle, some standard um, installation measures. Um, but you see also on the, on the lowest five renovation measures, it are the introduction of heat pumps that uh, the um, uh, estimations start to differentiate between the three different um, uh, empirical models. And there also are some, some uncertainties introduced uh, and the um, modeled um, estimations are not that reliable uh, as we would like. So I would like to share some insights and challenges uh, of this uh, research um, to conclude with. So regarding the data collection, you need a very large data set to average out that occupant behavior and to uh, be able to generalize a model for all kinds of dwellings. Uh, we do not include occupant characteristics in the modeling. Uh, because we want to estimate the average energy savings of a renovation for a housing station, regardless of its occupant, because the occupant change, uh, changes over time. Uh, um, then, regarding the building characteristics, they need to be quite detailed. So, to at least to be able to differentiate between governing renovation techniques. And all building characteristics need to be reasonably available in the data set and that also can be challenging certainly where um, yeah for the more new uh, renovation systems um, they are less available in the data set then something regarding the pros and cons of the different modeling techniques we see that a linear model uh, is simple and fast but it's not able to deal with interactions between building characteristics and therefore the estimations on the dwelling level are of a lower quality and the nonlinear model is able to find prescribed interactions between building characteristics, and therefore the estimations are more easy to interpret, uh, interpret that, and follow common sense. Uh, but uh, the gradient boosting model is able to find all kinds of interactions, where the nonlinear model only finds the prescribed interactions between uh, building characteristics. Um, so the gradient boosting model uh, can use all kinds of interactions between building characteristics to find a good estimation of the actual energy consumption. However, it's more a black box estimation and less easy to interpret um, the results. Then regarding some conceptual challenges uh, from inconsistencies in the data. So two examples given, the heat pumps. So in the data set, there was no differentiation between electrical, hybrid, or gas heat pumps. So the estimations are always averaged between these systems, but in reality, you always put in one of the three. So the estimations for the three um, yeah, are not very accurate or misleading. Uh, and another conceptual inconsistency that we found is that, for example, solar panels on um, apartments they are in the energy labeling system uh, attributed to a dwelling, but in reality, the um, uh, produced electricity can be um, monitored with general meters, so not, of the, not on the meter of the dwelling. Uh, so then you miss the production in the data set and the empirical model will uh, estimate uh, the production of solar panels lower than uh, it should. So that are uh, two conceptual inconsistencies, and there are uh, some more. Uh, then we also have some in introduction effects of new renovation techniques. So there can be a wrong match with uh, building characteristics in the data set and the actual consumption. Renovation is performed halfway in a year. Uh, so you need to be aware of that and also um, uh, screen your data for that. 
And it's the same for uh, new built dwellings. The occupancy of those new built dwellings uh, yeah, can be later. So the actual energy consumption can even one or two years later can be uh, lower than it should be. And that could also um, yeah, make the model less perfect. Uh, and then regarding the search for method to validate model production. So empirical models always give an estimation, but if the input is wrong, the output is also wrong. And it's challenging uh, for all individual renovation techniques to validate of the estimations are within reasonable boundaries. And confidence intervals would help to interpret these estimations, but are mathematically uh, also challenging. So I want to conclude. All the three examined empirical models give more realistic predictions on the sector level than the theoretical model. However, on a detailed uh, level, predictions for all different kinds of renovations introduce a high level of uncertainty, especially for dwellings with newly introduced systems like uh, heat pumps, for example. And there are some conceptual flaws which need to be resolved. Uh, regarding uh, the modeling technique, the linear model is uh, too simplistic, uh, and we think the nonlinear model uh, and or uh, gradient boosting method uh, are the most promising. So we still need to do more research to cover the conceptual flaws uh, to come to a final model to estimate the actual energy savings from renovation. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for listening. Okay. Thank you, Herman. Now I realize that for us and for many watching that the text and the and the slides were not very clear. So I hope that the sound was clear and that you could hear Herman because we are able now to ask questions to Herman. Um, also, I'm thinking maybe we can share. Let me see if I can share some slides, Herman. We can walk through a couple of the of the key graphs that you showed here. Um, and that might be helpful for, for people to see your main messages here in your model. And we can we can go through this a little bit and see what other questions come up. Fiona will give us some other questions. But if I if I share this, are people able to to see these a little more clearly? We can see if I if I move the controls. Um, we can see that the energy performance gap that you were talking about um, and the modeling of actual consumption here. So I'm just going to go quickly through so that people see some of the main messages that you had here. And the difference here in these slides between theoretical consumption and then the actual consumption in the models that you were that you were running here showing quite big differences for both the gas to energy and the, the um, electricity labels here. And again, then with the with the case study of the single dwelling with 23 renovations, we see again, the theoretical being the yellow, much different. So insights and challenges that you that you spoke through the pros and cons of the of the different modeling techniques. Again, these slides and the and the actual recording that you made will be available afterwards. But I'm just quickly going through. I think you had a timer on your PowerPoint as well, so it's it's going through here on a on a timer quite quickly. Um, but this will give us a chance to to ask some questions about this. So your your main point here also you talked about conceptual flaws. And that's one that I had a follow-up question. Are you now going to be working through, you're doing a PhD on this yes. topic. Are you working through some of these conceptual flaws? And can you tell us a little bit about the next steps here and what you're working on with this? Yes. Yes, for example, um, the heat pumps. Um, when we started modeling, we didn't really understand that the data quality was, wasn't uh, good enough to, to give clear results because of uh, yeah, there's no differentiation between the electrical heat pumps, the hybrids, or the gas fueled uh, heat pumps. And uh, in the next phase um, this year, we're currently correct collecting the data of housing associations again, 2 million dwellings. Uh, but this year it, it includes uh, the differentiation between these three um, uh, different types of heat pumps. Uh, and you need that uh, information to uh, improve that conceptual flaw uh, in a model. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to tackle. Uh, there are several conceptual flaws and you need to tackle them one by one to, to come to a clear data set where the models yeah, can learn uh, the actual energy consumption given the building characteristics. Yeah, so you have this conceptual challenge. You also have a, a strong message here about the need for data um, and, and how big the data set is. Um, and what would you like to see in the 
I guess you had access to a, to a data set that was that was a bit richer and still had some conceptual um, challenges here. But what would you want to see in the way that data is collected generally in the EU or in the member state level that would help um, with this a bit more? Uh, if you want to build a top down model, uh, you clearly need uh, lots of uh, dwellings just to cover the occupant behavior aspect. So. I don't know in other countries how large the data sets are with the detailed building characteristics, but you need uh, quite large sets. And also these sets need to have uh, all different kinds of dwellings in it to, to be able to, uh, to come up with a model covering all kinds of um, dwellings and all kinds of possible renovations. Um, so yeah, you need, um, we, we do it on, a, on an annual level. So the annual energy consumption and the annual uh, building characteristics. And I think that's a good level to come up with, uh, with a, an empirical model, um, but yeah, it needs to be quite extensive. Yeah, and you would say that this should be a task taken on the governments collecting this data or because at one of you have housing associations with a little bit of help there for your model as well. Yes, so in, in, in the Netherlands, we are happy with the housing associations because they cover one third of the assets and are only 250 uh, associations, so we collect them within our research annually. Uh, but that's doable and probably other countries have uh, social housing as well, maybe a bit smaller, but maybe uh, that is a suitable approach for them as well. Uh, and also, uh, you need to think of um, where you can apply the model to, because we have only uh, dwellings of social housing associations and the income level of those dwellings is usually lower, so the actual energy consumption is also lower. So our model would fit the social housing uh, stock. Uh, and would not is not generally usable for the whole Dutch stock because the actual energy consumption within the private stock will be different. So that's also something to consider. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from our audience here as well. Do you think it would help your study to understand better what occupants what occupants are doing in their homes and why? Instead of averaging out, could you find a way to integrate an evaluation of occupant behavior? Yeah, you could. You could do that. It would be another PhD, I guess, but we, <laughs> we, we took the approach to just exclude it because a housing association wants to do a renovation or they want to renovate, for example, 100 dwellings um, with the same installation or level of installation. And then you want to um, yeah, find the actual energy savings regardless the inhabitant because it will also change um, uh, maybe after the, the renovation even. Um, so. I can imagine if you uh, would do this on a very long term, that would also nice to include the occupant behavior because maybe that can change over time. So if you fit a model like we do, it's, it takes the current situation. So yeah, it would be um, nice to do. It would take another PhD. We don't do it. Yeah, but maybe maybe the PhD following you, <laughs> you can when you always write your future research. Here, here's the next PhD. Um, here's another question: Was your measured and modeled data showing the energy that energy consumption varies very little with the energy efficiency energy label of the dwelling? If so, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think the energy labeling system it's not uh, totally bad. It's a, it's a theoretical way of expressing the quality of a dwelling and also, for example, the indoor quality or the, yeah, the I don't know, the indoor temperature and there with the comfort level of a, uh, a participant also includes, uh, is included within the energy labeling system. So I don't think it's all bad, but I don't think you should use it just to extrapolate uh, the energy savings you will, will get from um, improving energy labels. So that's I, why I think uh, both models are um, useful as well as a theoretical model as an empirical model. Do you think the theoretical model could learn, could take some of the empirics and incorporate it better? Yes, it, it, it would be a nice assignment to, um, to use empirical data to uh, validate the, the theoretical model, but there also you need to be aware of the, the stock where you fit it on. So our model would fit the social housing station and the theoretical EPBD model is a general model for the whole stock. So you certainly need to cover that first so that you are able to fit the theoretical model on a whole stock. Mm -hmm. And who so far has been the, the audience of your research and how would you like them to, to use your findings? Uh, my original goal was to give a model which uh, can actually be used within the Dutch uh, environment. Um, but then we still need uh, to, um, to, to, to close the conceptual flaws for them uh, to be able to use it. And I think uh, because the data is from Dutch uh, housing stations, it will only, only be useful in the Dutch uh, context, but other researchers could learn from this approach to make uh, similar models for their situation. 
Yeah, and speaking of which, we have a question about a, another situation. So I've seen similar findings for the UK. One problem is the assumption in the model about how much the home is heated. Yes. Uh, do you agree you found that as well? Yeah, and it's uh, widely spread in literature. So we know why the per performance gap is there. Um, not always how big it is, but it is, uh, it, it is there. And uh, yeah, we just try to cover it with uh, an empirical approach. Mm -hmm. um, oh yes, it's the same, same question here. Um, anything that, that you want to make sure that, that our audience gets across from you? Because I know that, that also the presentation, there were, there were some blurry slides there, but some of your take home messages for this audience as well. So we've talked about the data, the conceptual, but for this EC Tripoli, um, or EC Tripoli audience, what would you like them to also take from your study? I think uh, when you start, you everybody thinks it's very easy to do it, um, but then you just need to start building those models and then you will understand that it's still quite difficult to make those empirical model, but I would, um, yeah, I, I hope all the researchers will, will, will just try this approach as well, because I think we need empirically uh, fit models to uh, enhance uh, the sustainable development of the built environment. Yep, I agree. Okay. I think we have gone through all of the questions from our audience, unless there are any more that you found, Fiona. No, all right. I haven't found any more. Thank you. I think what we might do is move on to our next presenter, just because we might need some extra time with the with the um, uh, presentation here. And let's see if we sort out. Thank you very much, Herman. And again, you can find Herman throughout the the conference and uh, on also ask some more one on one questions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, to you, Fiona. Okay, I would like to introduce Patrice, our next speaker. He's an engineer, a researcher on energy transition and long-term scenarios at EDF R&D, and he's been working there since 2003. His focus in his work is on the household approach, both dwelling and transport, and territorial analysis. Over to you, Patrice. Okay, so I will try to do it uh, live with sharing a PDF file. So tell me if you can see the... The screen. Yep. Is it okay for you? Uh, I don't see the. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, because I don't see the, the chat anymore. Uh, so hello, I'm very happy to to present this today. So the the idea of this paper is to present the the evaluation of a national uh, incentive scheme, uh, which has for objective to. Um, to foster the, the replacement of heating systems. And we will look specifically at the impact for low-income households. And you will see that it's a very nice scheme, but potentially with very poor effects. And we will see why. So the objective, oops, I just, the objective so is to evaluate this impact. It's also to, to present uh, our model. Uh, and this evolution will be based on the, um, the observation of on how it modifies uh, the competitiveness of different technologies on different types of households and different types of housing. For this, we use a, a disaggregated model, uh, which is also a bottom-up one. Uh, it allows to consider a very wide variety of situations, all of which have very specific renovation potentials and different prof profitability of actions. Uh, so it's something much interesting than uh, thinking with average values or segment, for instance. Uh, and once we have the picture of the building stock and uh, household stock, uh, we will use a discrete choice modeling to represent this competition between the different systems and see how the, the grant scheme modifies this competitiveness. Um, oops. I launch my counter too. <laughs> uh, so our model is called uh, BBOP, like uh, building energy bottom up and prospective. Uh, it is a disaggregated one, which means that we model each and every dwelling and households. Uh, in this case, we, we, we base our uh, study on a national survey, uh, which has 30,000 dwellings. Uh, and for each dwelling, we uh, describe the geometry, the levels of insulation of the different elements of the envelope, uh, the ventilation, we take uh, into account the local uh, climate data, 
and we describe systems with the different efficiencies like generation, distribution, emission, regulation, and so on. And once we have this, uh, you will see the bottom-up part, so the engineer part of the modeling, which is that we, we can perform a, a thermal calculation, which is simplified. It's the, um, the national French method for the energy performance certificates. So it's a yearly based uh, calculation, but it allows us to really know what we do and to explicit the different actions. Um, once we have this picture with uh, all the dwellings and households described, then we have so our new feature which models the, the evolution of the competitiveness of different technologies uh, so maybe i will not go into the too much into detail because it's very classical uh, we model when a system has to be replaced uh, we propose different alternatives and these different alternatives have a probability to be chosen and this probability uh, is described uh, in in function of the total cost uh, along the lifetime, uh, which is the LCC, the levelized life cycle cost. Uh, so it's a ratio between the, the, the life cycle cost of one technology and all the other technologies with pro, which provides the, the probability. And with this little gamma coefficient, uh, which represents the market heterogeneity, which means that people don't always take the cheapest technology. So it's a bit more realistic than just a yes or no and take the cheapest one. In our levelized cost, we consider the capital cost uh, of the system, the transition cost, which means that if you move to a natural gas, you will have to connect to the network. If you move to the district heating, also you will have to connect to the network. And if you move out from um, a petrol boiler, you will have to, to remove your tank, which is also something which has a cost. Uh, and then we have the, um, the running cost, the so maintenance cost, and the energy bill. Uh, all of these are uh, discounted over the lifetime of the, the technology. So here we have the, the small r, which is the private discount rate. Uh, for the household and n, which is the number of years of the, uh, the, the lifetime of our technology. Um, and for our energy bill, we, we consider the conventional consumption of the household because in general, the energy company uh, based their calculation on the conventional uh, behavior, not on the real uh, bills of the, of the household. Uh, we consider the efficiency of the system and we will consider the, the current price of energy, uh, which uh, reflects a myopic expectation, which is something uh, quite classical. So here you, you see that this probability will, will really uh, rely on the specific characteristic of the household uh, through the um, discount rate and the characteristic of the dwelling, uh, given the energy need, the efficiency of the existing uh, system or the efficiency of the new system. Uh, concerning the household, we differentiate the behavior through the um, discount rate, uh, which reflects the, uh, the, the, the preference in terms of risk, uh, in terms of return on investment that you want to have now or in the future. And we differentiate it between people living in single family houses, collective uh, dwellings and social housing. And also given the, the type of uh, heating system, whether it's individual or collective, because you don't have the same uh, possibilities. And, and so the, the best case is for social housing because you have just one uh, big company uh, uh, doing things. And the worst is when you are renter in a single family house because uh, it's the landlord who would choose and not you. <laughs> Um, then our national grant scheme, uh, it's a scheme that wants to foster the phasing out of fossil fuel and also to mitigate fuel poverty. So that's the two main objectives. Uh, and so it provides incentives which are based on the, the type of household, whether you are low income or others. Uh, you have to replace a fossil fuel boiler and uh, you can only have this uh, uh, six type of new systems 
Uh, and so the grants start from a few hundred euros and it can be uh, uh, 4,000 euros if you are low income and if you choose a biomass boiler or a air water heat pump or an hybrid oil heat pump. So here again, the fact that our model uh, has for each dwelling, the initial system and also the income of the household uh, allows us to, to model this. So now the results. Uh, and before showing the, the, the evolution of the market share, we, we will see how the, the life cycle costs of different technologies are modified with the scheme. And so you have on the left a, a reference scenario without incentive and on the right uh, our scenario with the national scheme. And we represent here just for single family houses and low income uh, households uh, to just to restrict our presentation. And you will see that with the grants, uh, our problem is that it modifies for sure the, this life cycle cost, but it will make cheaper uh, technologies that were already among the cheapest and a bit cheaper technology, which were uh, very not competitive and, and which stays not competitive. Uh, so in fact, you provide uh, money to people we, we will, will not uh, change their behavior and just uh, take the money. Uh, so for instance, the hybrid oil electric heat pumps, they were very expensive and now that they are a bit, a little bit less, but they are still uh, on the top of the, um, the ranking. And on the other side, uh, wood, wood boilers were already cheaper, uh, cheap, and now they become a bit cheaper. So uh, uh, they will progress a bit quicker, but uh, you will not change the, the mix of systems. Uh, and now if we look at the result in terms of market share, uh, so here again for single family houses and for low income households. Um, and if you just look quickly, you don't see any difference, but if you look a bit sharper, you will see that uh, even without incentive, the, the fossil fuel boiler in red, uh, petrol based, they will uh, go away. And that's already what we see uh, with the ground, it will be a, much, a bit uh, quicker, but uh, it will not change many things. Uh, we see that we will have, we would have, with thanks to, to the modeling, uh, a big penetration of uh, heat pumps, but uh, most of them would be air to air heat pumps because they are cheaper. And also they are out of the scheme. You, you don't have grants for air to air heat pumps uh, because in France, the, the government fears that people use it for air conditioning. Uh, we will have a lot of systems based on wood, so the, the green ones, uh, either wood stove or wood stove with air to air heat pump or uh, wood boilers. And the problem is also that the, the, you can have a ground to, to replace your, your boiler with a gas boiler, with a, an efficient gas boiler, but still gas boiler. And so with the ground scheme, you see that you have a bit more uh, in orange, a bit more gas boilers. Uh, and so in terms of climate mitigation, it's not really <laughs> uh, the, the, the good idea, I think. Um, if we look now at our household with, uh, with low income, uh, on the left, you have the impact on energy bills. And you will see that whether you are in the reference scenario or in the grand scheme scenario, uh, for low income households, you will have an increase of 40% uh, without grants and 10% with the grants. Uh, so it's a bit, um, a bit lower, but it's still an increase. Uh, you have almost no differences for other uh, households because they have more capability to change their system and choose the system with the lower running cost. And if you look at uh, the impact on in terms of energy burden, which means the, the, the share of the budget that is spent for energy, uh, for low income households and others, and with or without the scheme, uh, you will see that uh, you still have an increase and the impact of the scheme is very small. You, you can hardly see it. So the scheme has an effect, but it's very, uh, very poor. So as a conclusion, uh, so we, we could show what would happen uh, only taking account for monetary costs, 
So that means we, we even didn't consider uh, the different barriers to energy efficiency, like the lack of information uh, and so on. So even without this, we don't see much difference. Uh, and so that the national scheme will have very poor results compared to the business as usual scenario. Uh, for the low income uh, households, we see that the impact is very limited. It's something not new. We, we know that just giving a grant has already not uh, much impact. Uh, but concerning the model, we see that it's interesting to really see what happens uh, for different type of household, different type of dwellings and really see how the difference uh, appears. Um, and for the um, greenhouse gas emissions, it's also clear that uh, the scheme doesn't help to, to go quicker than normal. And also subsidizing uh, efficient gas boiler is not sustainable in the long run. So that's all <laughs> and I'm ready for the questions. Thank you very much. Um, sorry that you had to uh... Speak live when you've done the recording. Um, so I've got some, I'm going to take a moderator um, imperative as it were and ask some questions. So one thing that really struck me, Patrice, was how big the difference um, were in the discount rates for homeowners and renters. And obviously that will have a big effect on the cost effectiveness of these sort of capital heavy measures. So how, where did, how did you derive those discount rates? Uh, so it comes from the literature. So I didn't spend too much time because we have a lot sure. in the literature, specifically from uh, Gaëtan Giraudet, uh, which, is, uh, which is also a French researcher and presented something at the Institute uh, last year and right. years before. Okay. And he works in, um, in a laboratory which is really specified on uh, economy. So I, I would say... Uh, but I'm sticking on the engineer side and I rely on <laughs> his Other results people. for, yeah, for sure. this part. And he made a lot of um, uh, sensitivity analysis for the, this specific coefficient for the market heterogeneity, for instance, and also for the, the, the discount rates. Um, I mean, so did you do sensitivity analysis in your model on discount rates? Uh, Quickly, not very deep and seriously, I would say, just to have confidence that I, I just I don't provide results that will dramatically change if I change just one thing. Okay. Uh, so it's something I will do uh, for the next steps, uh, the sensitivity analysis, and also maybe in this case the idea was not to be totally realistic, but just uh, not changing everything at the same time just sure. to see the, the effect because. At the end, you, you don't know. It's very difficult to interpret when you have too much things uh, yeah, yeah. changing. But maybe if I add uh, other barriers uh, to energy efficiency, like the inertia of pre preferences, for instance, uh, I will try to, um, to calibrate the model, start in the past and see if I can reproduce uh, what happened. Right. Yeah. Uh, that okay. was not the idea here. <laughs> uh, we've got a question from one of the attendees from Tina Fawcett. Patrice, the percentage of heating involving wood seems very high. In the UK, we are seeing restrictions on wood burning due to concerns about air quality and health. Mm -hmm. Are there concerns about this in France? Won't this reduce the acceptability of wood for heating? Yes, absolutely. So here we just consider uh, the, the cost of systems. And at the moment, we don't have a restriction except in the region of Paris. So in the city of Paris, you, you are not allowed to, to use uh, uh, wood, uh, but in the past the, the government was really fostering wood system and also the national agency for energy efficiency and we see more and more concern about uh, air quality. So if we let the system go, you see that the wood system will, uh, will take a lot <laughs> of market share, uh, but if then you have a specific policies uh, preventing this, then we can consider it into the model. Uh, for instance, Basing on the city density, the density of population, and saying right. that in dense area we don't consider wood systems, and in other area in the countryside we can allow this, and it would be a way to um, to maybe to restrict a bit. And as EDF is an electricity company, uh, I don't want to to remove wood and <laughs> just put electricity. <laughs> so I, I let other people do or, or tell me uh, which barrier I should implement. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, I have another question. Have you shared the results of a model with whoever is responsible for this policy? And if so, what, what was their reaction? Uh, so uh, not at the moment, but I presented similar results with a, a version of the model, which is not uh, modeling the choice of household, but where you, you put by end the hypothesis. You, you say, let's say we have this share of wood, this share of electricity, and you see the result mm -hmm. uh, in a simulation way. And we, we made regional studies in France for each region. And uh, in the region of Paris, of course, the, the agency for air quality said, oh, stop. <laughs> and it's very difficult because if you don't, you have to go towards zero carbon. Sure. If you don't rely on wood, you just have uh, heat pumps and district heating. Mm -hmm. But in Paris, you, you already have a, a large share of district heating. And so you don't have so much uh, uh, levers then to... <laughs> to yeah, well, it is, it, I just, given that this the modeling shows that it, there is very little change, it would be really interesting to know what the policyholders, if you present it like that, how they mm -hmm. would react and whether they'd, you know, what they do. So, um, yes, I think they, they know because there is a, a lot of literature since many years that they're, that just giving a grant uh, doesn't make the job. You okay. have a lot of free 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 riders, yeah, <laughs> for sure. instance. Uh, but the policy in France, you know, is a, a bit fuzzy. Uh, <laughs> sometimes they are looking to carbon, sometimes to energy, sometimes it's not consistent, and and it's uh, changing every, every time, and and with not so much evaluation because. Uh, we don't have this evaluation culture as like you can have in the northern country or in the UK. I'm not sure about the UK, but um, so <laughs> one other question we see from here. <laughs> is um, well, is you looked at the um, the heating technology switch, but I would imagine that well, I, I gather that the policy also then has support for increasing energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. So I wondered were you intending to add in energy efficiency and see whether that changed how effective the policy was? Uh, yes, of course, because, uh, so it's an idea for, for the future. And also I wanted just to stick on the, the specific uh, system sure. replacement. For uh, insulation, it's much more difficult because uh, you have to change your systems when they break, <laughs> you, you have to change your system. But for instance, insul insulating your walls, you have absolutely not, no obligations. Uh, and so you have to start to model whether people will do something or not. And then if they insulate a lot uh, or not. And so either we stick on the heating systems and we just consider a trend in energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. So for each drilling, we have the current situation and the, the best situation possible. And we consider a trend which, which goes toward the, the a total insulation, for instance. And we will see that the systems that are very expensive and provide a lot of uh, savings uh, will be less competitive uh, if you are well insulating, for instance, than okay. if you keep without insulations. And the other option is to, uh, in the same way as the system, to consider that you have a lifetime for each element of the envelope. Uh, and at the end of the lifetime, you you have you may do something, and you you choose the, the cheapest one, or the uh, either you do nothing, or if it's profit for profitable, you, you do something. Uh, okay, we've yeah. got a couple more, and then I think um, we need to wrap up and move on to our final speaker. <laughs> so one from Guillaume Bm. I apologise if I mispronounce that. Have you been using the model to find out which grant level would be required to reach significantly higher impacts for climate protection? Uh, no, because it's not an optimization model. So um, I can change the energy prices, uh, scenarios, the efficiency of systems, and then just look what, what, what happens. Uh, maybe in the future, we could use it at, uh, as a simulation um, optimization model, just saying we want to reach carbon neutrality and uh, what is the level of the grant that you have to, to put. Okay. Um, and yeah. a final question. Um, the issue is that there are other policies on space heating which also play out in the same time as the subsidies policy. Do you take those into account? Uh, in fact, what, is, what has the, the more impact is more the, the regulation more than the incentives there. Right. That, but, but are they, 
are they accounted for in your model or is that too difficult? No, yeah, it's really just a ground system. Okay. Uh, yeah, but in the future also, you, you won't have the right to replace a noise boiler. So sure. even with or without exactly. grounds, <laughs> it will be much more efficient, I think. All right, um, if we can move on to Tobias then, please. Um, we're going to try again with the recording. Um, Tobias is a scientist with the Institute for Housing and Environment, Darmstadt, Germany. He focuses, as well as the topics of this question, on energy performance certificates, monitoring of refurbishment activities, building stock assessment, and cross-country comparisons. Over you, Tobias. Hello everybody, my name is Tobias Loger. I'm researcher with the Institute for Housing and Environment in Germany. Together with my co-author and colleague Guillaume BM, I would like to present to you research work we have done in the framework of the project Mobasi, which is carried out in cooperation with three housing companies, Baufer Energie Darmstadt, Wohnbau Gießen and Nassauischer Heimstätte Wohnstadt in Frankfurt am Main. The work is funded by the German government. The topic of my presentation is target actual comparison and benchmarking used to safeguard low energy consumption in refurbished housing stocks. So what are the challenges we are facing? Half of the 40 million homes in Germany are in multifamily houses. they of about one third is owned by housing companies. And most of these multifamily houses are heated by central heating systems, which are, which are operated by the housing companies. So when the housing companies get the energy bill, they just forward them, forward the bills to them, to the tenants, which are of course supposed to pay them regardless of the energy standard of the building. So it's just a transit item for the housing companies. However, Many housing companies put a lot of effort into energy refurbishment and um, driven by the challenges of the climate crisis and also um, to improve the living conditions for their tenants. However, most of them do not systematically track the applied measures and the energy savings. So the idea of the Mobasi project here is to develop a concept for target actual comparison and benchmarking and to apply the concept in cooperation with housing companies. The idea is to attach to processes which are already running in the housing companies and to just add elements which are able to collect and store information about the energy performance of the buildings. So if we take an example building um, with a, which is not yet refurbished, um, with an annual energy consumption of about 200 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. Um, so the housing company decided, decides to make uh, an energy refurbishment. <clears throat> the planning is carried out by uh, the housing company itself or by uh, commissioned architects or civil engineers. Um, the new element is now that we store specific information about the energy performance um, of the building, of about the theoretical energy performance, um, about the thermal envelope, about the, um, the um, heating system in a monitoring database. This enables us to determine um, the expectation range for the energy consumption. Now, the refurbishment has taken place. The energy consumption is on a new level and the heat billing is performed as the years before. Um, um, this is uh, as usual. Now the new element is that we store the information about the en annual energy consumption also in the monitoring database and assign it to the information about the energy state of the building. So now we can compare the metering with the expected um, range of energy consumption. <clears throat> Usually there will be no problem that will be f that, that will fit, but in some cases there may be an exceedance. And in this in these cases, we can have a closer look at the operating conditions of the building, maybe also at the user behavior. 
Um, so we don't have to do this for all the buildings, but only for those where an exceedance has been found. And of course, we can't continue this process because the information is stored about the, 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 the um, state of the building. We can, can, can continue this process uh, in the building stock and also um, um, ex extend it to other buildings which are, um, which are refurbished. For the collection of the information about the energy performance um, characteristics of the buildings, energy profile monitoring indicators are used, which are a specific set of query variables and which are indicators uh, on the physical characteristics of a building uh, that have the biggest impact on its energy performance. These indicators can in principle be collected by on-site inspections um, or by asking building owners. Um, that's also the reason why these indicators are used or, or have been used in German energy housing surveys in the years 2009 and 2016. We have, get a closer look at the form for the building. Uh, at the top, we have uh, general information, living space, number of stories. Um, then we get information about the number of attached buildings, uh, geometrical information, and um, about the state of uh, heating situation in the attic and in the basement. And we get information about um, insulation upgrade, thickness of insulation, area friction, year of insulation, and about the window types, the number of panes, the, the low EQ, low EQ, information about low E coating, um, about frames, about the year of insulation um, uh, of the windows. So now that we have gathered the energy profile indicators for all the buildings in the database, um, a transformation is done to input variables for a physical model. The input variables consist of calculation values and an uncertainty range. Since we are dealing with um, existing buildings, not all information is available. So we make a treatment of missing information um, we, in these cases where uh, something is missing, we use averages uh, which are valid for the to total building stock. And at the same time, we increase the uncertainty, um, the typical range of this variable. So this is also done for the boundary conditions. Also here we have calculation values and an uncertainty range um, for the user behavior and for the, um, for the climatic data. Now we can perform an energy balance calculation with a physical model and get one value for the um, one value, the energy use um, of the building. And we do a second calculation where we take all these uncertainties of the input parameters and calculate the resulting uncertainty of the energy use. So we get a value for the energy use and we get an uncertainty of this value um, from our calculation. Now we are coming to the implementation of the concept. As mentioned earlier, we are cooperating with three housing companies and they have uh, provided data of buildings in three groups, um, uh, refurbished buildings, ABC, and one group, um, group D, with buildings uh, which are not yet refurbished. And so we have got um, 155 building data sets of building entities, which are mostly apartment blocks, 165 apartment blocks, uh, consisting of uh, more than 3,000 dwellings. Now we have calculated for all the buildings in the database the energy use and can compare it with the, the meter reading. And on the left side, you see a chart where all of these values are included. You see here the orange bars, um, which are meter readings, and you see the blue bars, with, which are um, the calculated energy use, and you see also the um, uncertainty of the calculated energy use. And now we can compare the meter reading with this uncertainty range. Um, these values are sorted um, 
according to the um, ratio of calculated uh, energy consumption and meter reading. At the top, you see here buildings where we have uh, a lower energy consumption than the expectation range. And at the bottom, you see buildings where um, the, the measured energy consumption uh, exceeds the expectation range calculated. We see that for most of the buildings here, um, the energy consumption lies within um, this um, expectation range, but for some not. And the idea of the project is now to have a closer look at these buildings because maybe there is something wrong. So now we can have a closer look at the buildings with suspiciously high or suspiciously low uh, energy consumption. And the first steps are to check the building data and the heat billing data and maybe correct the data in the database. And the next step is an on-site inspection of the thermal properties of the building fabric and the heat supply system. And the further step is to examine the operating conditions and the use of heavy behavior. Uh, in the project, we have already done the step one and step two and have co could correct some of the input data to improve the data quality. The next step will be to have a, uh, to make these on-site inspections um, where, uh, and try to find out wh why energy consumption is, actual energy consumption is higher than expected or lower is than expected. Now we can have a look at the coherence of the reality-based physical model and actual consumption. Um, so we make a scatter plot, metered energy consumption by calculated energy use. For example, if we take one uh, point here, um, we got uh, an energy use calculated 103 kilowatt hours per square meter in year, and we got a metering of 95 kilowatt hours per square meter in year. We now divide the calculated energy use into intervals and have a closer look at these intervals. Uh, first of all, we see the number of buildings um, which are included in the interval. And now we have uh, made, uh, calculated the average energy consumption for um, each interval. In this case, we have an energy, energy consumption, an average energy consumption of 112 kilowatt hours per square meter in year. And we can also determine the scattering of the consumption, the standard va va uh, vari deviation, which is uh, 21 kilowatt hours per square meter in year. This has been repeated for all intervals of the energy, uh, of the calculated energy use. And so now we get averages of the energy consumption for each interval. The results are encouraging. As you see, the values are very close to the bisecting line. So there is no strong um, systematic deviation between the metered energy consumption and the calculated energy use. This is in contrast to findings um, where an energy performance certificate calculation has been used, um, where we find um, curves which are more than, uh, than that. So th the values um, for the energy for the calculated energy use are higher, much higher for an unrefurbished buildings than for uh, than the metered energy consumption. I'm getting to the resume now. We have developed a method for target actual comparison and benchmarking in housing companies, which consists of a monitoring table, including energy profile indicators. We've developed a reality-based physical model where we retreat missing information and assign uncertainties. We have applied it to a collection of datasets of about 150 apartment blocks and found that the physical model is rather reliable. Um, we have investigated, we have identified buildings with a suspiciously high energy consumption or a suspiciously low energy consumption and found by checking the data some errors which we corrected. Uh, now this is a better match but there are still some buildings where the um, energy consumption is higher than the expectation range. And here we want to go to the buildings, make on-site inspections and try to improve the operating conditions um, in the buildings. The perspectives are 
that we try to, uh, to, of course, to extend the database to more buildings, maybe to the whole stocks of the building companies, and to try to um, reach a continuation on an annual basis of the target actual comparison. That could be part of an energy management in the housing companies. The challenge is, of course, that additional staff would be necessary and that costs money. But however, it could be a contribution to a strategic portfolio management towards carbon neutral housing stocks, including annual determination of annual refurbishment rates and tracking the actual greenhouse gas emission reduction on the way to the carbon neutral housing stock. So many thanks for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions now. Thank you very much, Tobias. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that we're still having problems with the uh, with the visual um, side of the slides, but at least we could hear you and you had nice big text, so most of it I hope was legible. Apologies. I hope everybody has got an impression of uh, the pictures and of the charts also. If there's a need, I can uh, try to share it again, but we try to answer the questions now, I think. Okay, um, so I, I think you've answered my first question, which is have you, because uh, obviously the paper was several weeks ago, have you done more investigation? And the answer is yes, but you, there's still more to do. So that's interesting. Um, and, and you said there is the plan to extend this to other buildings. Um, yes. So, okay, that's another one. Um, so what has been the response from the building owners so far? What, are, what are, how have they found it? Um, so there, there are different uh, housing companies and they have different interests, of course. All are dedicated to, to, to um, uh, answer the questions how the uh, refurbishment rate is and how they sh should uh, um, 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 make it more, make them or get a more higher refurbishment rate. Sure. So, um, and they are now starting to think about how to track um, the refurbishments. So, but there are problems. Um, what they fa are facing is that the energy performance certificates, which are issued when the refurbishment is done, um, it is not um, designed to collect information which is put in to the calculation. So um, it is very, um, it's not so easy to collect the information, um, uh, the input information from the certificate. So they have uh, to make a double system. So they make the energy performance certificates and collect the indicators. But it's, it's in, in principle, it's possible because the double system has also advantages because um, we, in our systematics, we, when we get um, to, when you get the information of the building, and we don't see that there is on the roof, there's, we don't have the information that in the roof is insulation. Right. So we, we, tr tr we do not, uh, when, you, when I issue a, a energy performance certificate, I'm obliged to make um, the, the, the worst assumptions for yes. the certificate. And, but that leads to high values for the U values for the, for the energy performance of the, of the envelope. And now when I do this for collecting information, I just mentioned it is not known. So it can be refurbished in the past, it could be refurbished in the past or not. So I have for this information, I have only the, 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 um, the full extent of possible answers. And okay. I, tr I try to include this information also in the uh, physical model so that we, when we do an, an um, uncertainty estimation, we when a, a single information is missing, we just, the, the uncertainty will be, uh, get higher. So that's, that's the idea. Um, so we've got a question from some of the attendees, um, one from Tina Fawcett. Tobias, apologies if you explained this. Are you modeling all energy use, including electricity and lights and appliances, or heating and hot water energy use only? No, good question. Only heating and domestic hot water, because that's, that's the responsibility of the housing companies. As I uh, said in, in the beginning, there is um, um, the, 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 um, the, they have to pay it first, and so they get it paid by the tenants. And um, yes, yeah, so the, we are sticking just to this, and we do not have the information about the electricity consumption uh, of the housing of the of the um, tenants of the of the buildings. Okay, um, so we have a question from Gavin Killip. You're finding that a good engineering model is more reliable than the EPC. 
surely has implications for EPC policy. Why are P EPCs so inaccurate, do you think? Could EPCs use better models and better surveys? EPC is to make, um, to, 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 to calculate if the requirements are met and to, to determine um, 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 the quality of the building in terms of energy use. And as I said, if you have not, informa not the information you are supposed to, 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 to set them on the highest value uh, that could be possible. And so we, tr we have to uh, go another way where we try to find always the average uh, input uh, for the model and also the, the, the spread of this um, input. Um, and that's, this has nothing to do with, with, with an energy performance certificate. This is more an evaluation instrument. And, and we should uh, try to um, find the second way and, and go the second way because otherwise we will not be able to model the energy consumption for the building stock. Okay, well, there's a, a number of questions around this. Um, one from Barbara Petalin Vishnevik, apologies again, mispronouncing. What do you think is, is the reason um, for the bigger difference between metered and calculated energy consumptions with EPC? I mean, you've already said about the, the having to make assumptions what else do you think are the key differences? Of course, there's differences. Uh, I, I spoke of the thermal quality of the building. Um, we we sh should try to, to, to uh, find the, the, the values. But of course, we are speaking of um, indicators uh, which can be measured at the building itself. So the first uh, problem is when we start with the U values, that is an abstract value, um, we don't have the information how is this calculated. So we need the information. Um, uh, is, has, what, what age is the building? Um, has the insulation been applied and when? And we, if we don't have the insulation thickness, we just take the average from this um, time band when the insulation has been applied. But if we have measured the insulation thickness, we can pu put it into the model. And so um, that, that's, that's the approach. And that's the same is true for the, the living conditions, for the for the um, temperatures in the buildings. <clears throat> we, we know that um, for very good uh, buildings, for a passive house with a very high insulation, um, with a, a, a quality, um, the living conditions are more to the, to the values which the uh, people like to have. So we, we have measured in, 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 um, <clears throat> in model projects 22 degrees as an average for these, um, for these, uh, for these um, uh, buildings and um, house in, from housing companies. And, um, but when we have a look at the old stock, then um, the, the, uh, um, heating is uh, uh, expensive. <clears throat> and um, we also do, do not heat all the rooms all the time. So this has an effect of the average temperature in the room. So what, we, what you, you need to do is to uh, also model the, 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 the um, user behavior in a way that is realistic. And this is also not the intention of the energy performance certificate because here everything should be comparable to each other. So these differences don't, don't occur. So we have to, to go a second way um, where we try to um, uh, make a, a model of the, of the reality, also climatic data, et cetera. So in a way, yeah, your model is trying to answer a different question. It has a different function yes. and therefore yes, it's not surprising yeah. that yeah. it comes up with different. Um, um, uh, Jessica, when, I don't know, we've, we've over on each <laughs> um, speaker because we had all these technical difficulties. I don't know um, how we want to deal with the, the time. We, we have another 15 minutes left, so. Yep, I think we had one more question, the similar question. I don't know if you asked the question in the chat from Dominic. Um, and I think then we also have some general. So we could we could um, ask these questions um, to, to finish up the last few mm -hmm. minutes here. I think from Dominic, it was also this question about the calculated values are not correlated to the methodology of German energy performance certificates. Um, if so, how large are the deviations there? 
And this is a so question have, for you, Tobias, then we can go back. We have done another project where we used um, the, the energy performance certificate uh, model from Germany. And uh, there we found that the deviation was um, that the um, energy, the calculated energy use was 40 to 50 percent um, higher than the measured energy use. So um, that, that was the result. And we also um, draw some conclusions from this and uh, designed a calibration method where we can, when we have the energy certificate uh, result, we can, uh, we can um, try to um, determine the expected energy consumption of the building due to the comparison between the metered consumption and the certificate result. So there is a correlation, but we have to, we have to do uh, such um, 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 uh, um, calibration of the method. And this works fine. We can also give an uncertainty of, of this calibration because um, due to the comparison between com uh, measured consumption and calculated co uh, consumption by the energy certificate, we get some deviations. And this is also, and this is um, 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 the spread is um, the uncertainty of this model of this moral uh, um, um, of this um, uh, not physical model, but of this comparison model. So. Um, we, so it's possible to, to work with the energy certificate if you calibrate it. And um, so it, it's, um, the result is more, more reliable. There's also some difference between our country and others. We have these consumption values in, house, in housing stock for buildings and not for, for uh, flats. So that's a huge difference because the energy consumption of flat is influenced by many, many, many parameters of temperatures uh, on all sides and only a little by um, the, the energy uh, for, for each flat sing, uh, in single for, for the building. It's the, sa it's the same, but if we consider the metered energy consumption, so it's much more difficult than when you get the energy consumption of the, of the complete house. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so we've got one more question is from Dominic Rao. If there is a strong correlation between the real consumption values and the EPSA, if, if that data was available, I mean, it was obviously only applied to the types of buildings you're talking about, um, Tobias, but that would, there would be a lot of enthusiasm to have access to that and maybe you know, be able to use that in other research. Um, I'd like to, uh, so this is the first time that the authors have heard their fellow panelists um, information and there is quite a lot of feed through between the different papers so I'd like to give them the opportunity to ask each other questions. <laughs> oh, I have a question for uh, Tobias. Yeah. So they also have problems with uh, the GDPR like the privacy law so in the Netherlands it's not uh, okay to have the actual data of a dwelling level only in the statistical environment of the Central Bureau of Statistics so how do you deal with that? Um, yes, we, we do not in our investigation we do not use the values from the, the from the tenants from the, the consumption values from the tenants only for the whole building, and there we don't have the problems. But of course, if we go to the to the tenant level, um, it will become more critical. And um, yes, but we ca cannot really de derive good uh, results from this because, as I said, it's it's very dependent. And you, if you try to model this, you have to have so much information about the temperatures in the in the in the, in the apartments. Um, it's it's not possible for the whole bill, for the stock of a housing company. So we stick to the aggregated level buildings or uh, even uh, building blocks, um, which is which is mainly our level here. Um, and try to um, uh, draw conclusions from this because most of the building blocks are also heated by one heating um, boiler or central or uh, district heating. I, I can uh, mention another thing. It's uh, maybe about the uh, output data of the uh, EPCs values or versus the input data. So we, we do not ask the output data of the EPC values, but we get the input data of the values from the software provider. So maybe that's a way for you to, to enhance yes. your research. Yes, yeah, in, I know in Netherlands, we have very, very good conditions because there is a database already for, for which housing companies put in information about the EPCs. In Germany, we don't have this. We don't have a central database for, we don't, it's, it's up to the company and they have don't have the human resources to to build up these databases 
because you have also to identify the structure of the database, etc. And that's that's a you're very much um, uh, you know, advantage uh, on this level. So it's a it's a very good uh, starting point for you. Yeah, yeah, I can agree. There's uh, one single software. There were two. The business one single software provider who does uh, the software for all the housing associations in the Netherlands. But then within our research, we collect the database of the 250 housing associations. So we combine it to a general database. So we still need to do that step. But at least we have one software provider to uh, to talk with. And if we want to change the export, they do it for us. So that helps. And who's operating the database? An association of the housing companies, or is Yes, so together with, uh, with our, together with our research, so we have about 250 to 300 housing exchanges in the Netherlands, and, and there's an umbrella organization who covers Umbrella it. organization, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they, mm -hmm. um, under their name, we collect the data, and they also use it to benchmark the housing station. so there are other uh, uses for that database as well. Mm -hmm. It's a good tip for countries that might have such housing associations. I know here in Sweden, we also have such, so looking for this uh, this leverage for the data. Good point. So we had um, a question for Patrice that um, slipped through the net, I think that was probably down to me. Um, given that uh, the modeled grant incentive has only a small effect, what other policies based on your experience would you recommend? Could France introduce bans on fossil heating systems Would that work? And then I'd like to sort of, not quite that question obviously, but kind of if, if the other two speakers have any views on what what policies would be effective in, in renovation, um, it would be great to get those two. Can, but we can start with Patrice, please. Uh, yes, and the, the policy that I, I evaluated was the, the one what, which was in place last year. And this year we, we show a new report, so it's not still in place, but a new report showing what could be done with a really uh, setting up a specific organization for renovation, uh, uh, making people having a, a bank account, which is differentiated, uh, a different account uh, to get the subsidies and to reimburse the, the, the systems. So, so it's not mixed up with your uh, daily budget. <laughs> um, and so they really think in, in terms of uh, how to do it so, so that it works. Uh, because at the moment, we still have many information, many schemes, and it's very difficult for people to, 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 to find the right information, and specific, specifically for low-income households. Uh, even if they have 90% grant, but if they are still to pay uh, two or 3,000 euros, uh, they, they can't afford it. So, so they really have to, to have a zero euro to put, and that um, the bill reduction reimburses the, the investment uh, once you, you get rid of the, the grants. Uh, so this is one, one thing. And, and maybe in France, we, we are thinking also about regulation that when you, you sell or buy a new dwelling, uh, you have to, uh, to renovate it or to put money somewhere uh, in order to, to allow it to be renovated then. Uh, yes, yeah, it's sure that you cannot just rely to the the will of people to <laughs> to insulate walls once you <laughs> you have to destroy everything in your house. So you you've produced uh, another report suggesting this policy. Uh, no, no, it's, um, it's an ongoing from an institution uh, from a big national uh, bank, which is the La Caisse des Dépôts, and it's, it's a very interesting report that that says how oh, we could uh, do it so that it works a bit better than now. And maybe if you could share the link to that, Patrice, if it's published or? Yes, I will. Um, that would be, well, we <laughs> it's in French, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. <laughs> Google Translate can do so Exactly. <laughs> These days, if we're interested enough, no longer yeah, a barrier. Not so bad anymore. Um, Herman, how about you? Are you happy to? I can reflect uh, a bit about it uh, just from a social housing perspective. But in the Netherlands, you're not a, there's 80% has already a, a gas boiler, 10% old system, 10% new system, external heating or heat pumps. And you're not allowed to put in gas boilers in the new dwellings. And in 2050, we're just aiming at two tactics, only external heating or electrical heat pumps. So all the like 80% gas boilers will be phased out. That's, that's the main, main strategy. 
and wood systems are biomass we have really small percentages but we we do not i don't think it will increase we don't we we, we won't do it okay thank you tobias how about you um the grant programs are very important for the housing companies um, um to get uh, their, their measure of finance um, but of course, they need also strategies how they come to the, 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 the targets um, um, and get the money which they have to have uh, from their own resources. And um, one, one point which is discussed in Germany is also the questions, uh, question if the uh, uh, owner of the building um, should uh, pay parts of the, of the energy bill. Um, that, and that would, would be, of course, uh, uh, more motivation for the owner to, to, to do something. So that, that's a point uh, where we can get, get somewhere. Um, otherwise, the question of um, um, heat, um, uh, uh, heat supply um, by electric appliances, by um, uh, heat pumps, um, is something in, house, in, in the housing stock which is not, not yet uh, uh, common. Uh, even when, when the system is changed, they even put the, the same kind of system in there and it's still 80 degrees uh, um, uh, Celsius um, uh, temperature of the, of the heating system. And so um, instead of changing everything to a, a low temperature level to make it ready for, for heat pumps, uh, this is not yet taking place. So that should be a focus for the policy also to, to make run programs where housing companies can do this, uh, this transformation. Yeah, in the Netherlands, we did that the past year. So in 2017, we measured from 2017 to 2020, there were only like a few uh, housing companies who already renovated it, uh, electrical heat pumps, and now there are several percentages uh, who are doing it. So, so the uptake, we can just see it in our data set. Okay, oh, thank you. So we have, um, mm. thank you, Patrice. Uh, I'm not sure. I can share it with everyone. I will. Uh... Okay, repost re it because it came to just the, the panelists. So in the yeah. chat, we'll share the report that was referred to. Um, here we go. Um, yep. And I just also want to remind as we're as we're kind of wrapping up here, there might be some final words from everybody, but that any of the recordings that were a little blurry, there will be a standalone recording file. So you can you can watch that recording again. Um, and again, this is the, the start of a whole week of discussions. So you will see everyone that was here in the panel throughout the, the conference. And you can also message them with a question that you might have as well. So it is not the, the end, but only the beginning. Um, and this is the, the first of our, of our um, evaluation and monitoring uh, panels. So we hope to see you throughout the week at our different panel sessions. But I think despite some of the blurriness, all of our presenters did very well <laughs> and, and were, uh, could think on their feet very well. Um, and as an audience, you were very good at listening and asking great questions. So it was a very nice discussion. I learned a lot in the session today. Um, uh, Fiona, do you have any last words about the first session? No, I think you've said it beautifully. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow for session okay. or Very for much. panel four. And Thank enjoy you. the rest of today. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.